Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It doesn't take long for this playground colloquialism to sound like an exercise in delusion. We are social creatures. Given the right circumstances, the words of somebody else might wound us irrevocably. A guilty confession from a lover, a declaration of regret from a parent, or the broken promise of a lifelong friend. Some of us would sooner walk on hot coals than relive the experience of hearing these words from someone close enough to make their memory eternal. But the analogy of words and their mirroring of physical pain is surface level at best. In truth, words have a more profound power. They can be manipulated to unfurl diabolical plots. Levels of suffering that would make the most sinister dictator proud. And contrastingly, they can forge empires inspire individuals to rise to the zenith of their potential. This grand, dramatic display for change also takes the form of oral tradition, a story passed down from generation to generation, subtly modified over the years until it barely resembles the original event. It can even be a memory from one's past, exaggerated just the slightest bit each time until it is nothing more than a hollow fiction. This process may very well start with a single slip of a phrase. Therein lies the inconspicuous true power of words, their parasitic nature, how they wait dormant in our hearts until we are ready to share them, and in their flawed retelling, even we begin to forget how they first sounded. Between event and recollection, retelling and listening, entire worlds are summoned and reformed. Details puppeteered and important facts neglected. While we grasp at ghosts, we may find that we have accidentally gripped something as truth that is not quite so, or uttered an insidious piece of deceit that others will consider reality. So it's no large wonder that entire nations confuse fact with fiction, history with legend, and that generations can be taken in by what is little else than tall tales. So now I welcome you to take part in this intimate process by enjoying the retelling of America's first female serial killer. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and you are listening to the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. But before we get started with our story, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this show, you. Patrons of the Grimm family are what keep projects like this alive. Currently, new patrons get a set of stickers as well as an exclusive print of their choosing from the Grimm Theater Shop. They also get early access to articles, YouTube videos, and all kinds of content before it is released elsewhere. It remains the most direct way to support Mania. If subscriptions make you nervous but you'd still like to help out, TheGrimTheater.com sells a host of dark art by Astrid Grimm. But if you'd like to become an honorary member of the Grimm family, help us manifest even more art and stories into the world, please go to Patreon.com forward slash Harlequin Grimm to join our growing family. And now, let's begin the story. Lavinia Fisher may have obtained infamy by the end of her life, but her origins have been and remain shrouded in obscurity. It is not just time which eroded the fine details. Lavinia was an eccentric orphan of the world, hardened by an upbringing too troubled to come with clear records and dates. Her maiden name, let alone the location of her birth, remains a topic of debate. Some might say Lavinia herself was satisfied with leaving her past behind, like many born in the 1790s. She was no stranger to hard work, daily toil, and perpetual challenges. But for all the luxuries not afforded to her, she was blessed with an unmistakable beauty, charm, and a keen wit. To her, these were not merely graces, but dangerous weapons. For the majority of her short life, she lived in Charleston, South Carolina, married to John Fisher. Together, they owned an inn called the Six Mile Wayfarer House. The hotel was six miles north of Charleston, on a stretch of road with similar establishments, all named after their distance from the city, the fifth, fourth, and third mile house, and so on and so forth. 
This stretch of road in the back country was used by tradesmen and sellers of fur, tobacco, and other goods. As there were no other well-paved roads leading out of the city, these sellers would often travel with great deals of wealth after selling off their merchandise. This made the back country a dangerous place, infested with gangs and highwaymen who would prey on the livelihoods of others. In a stroke of irony, the outlaws and highwaymen that frequently robbed tradesmen used the same hotels as the travelers. But it was not all of the hotels and inns in that stretch of road. Over time, the fishers garnered a reputation for not just hosting criminals, but helping hide outlaws in their six-mile house. Turning a blind eye to the highwaymen was one thing. But soon enough, Lavinia recognized that what she and her husband was doing was pivotal to the lives of these criminals. The fishers were no longer innocent. They were complicit, even accomplices. But it was not for fear of incurring their wrath that made the fishers enthusiastic about abetting the outlaws. Both Lavinia and John romanticized the highwaymen. Lavinia in particular imagined them holding wealthy traders at gunpoint and shifting wealth into the hands of those who never knew luxury. The highwaymen were a rugged, easygoing, but tough lot, and out of all the guests that stayed in her inn, she looked forward to their company the most. What was a budding admiration for the outlaws turned into a kind of ambition. Her husband was happy to house them, take a portion of the stolen earnings and call it good. But in her early twenties, Lavinia recognized that the highwaymen weren't picking the roads clean. Here and there, merchants would stumble into their inn, pockets full, after having visited the city. With the help of her husband, Lavinia began to isolate lone travelers coming into the inn. After plying them with drink, they would talk long into the night, gain their trust, all the while discerning whether it would be worth it to rob them. But unlike the highwaymen, the fishers couldn't afford letting their victims go. Their entire identity was wrapped up in the inn. The catch-and-release method of the bandits would have to be modified, to put it lightly. After selecting a guest, they would send them up to their chamber for the evening. Lavinia would lace their tea with an herb that would put them into a deep, deep sleep. And in the early hours of the morning, her husband would sneak into their room. It was the most quiet hour, so quiet that the sound of the key gently scraping against the lock sounded like a shriek to him. His heart, pounding in his ears, were deafening drums. Unlike his wife, John didn't enjoy the crime, only the rewards. Nevertheless, he would smother the guests in their sleep and strip their corpses of any valuable belongings or wealth. It wasn't long before this became a practiced operation. As the pile of bodies grew, the six-mile wayfarer house began to feel cramped. Death lingered in every room. Stolen lives choked the air. The childless husband and wife adopted a slew of orphan phantoms, their crimes quickly overshadowing the highwaymen that so inspired them. All the while, Lavinia only grew more beautiful. Her charm and wit sharpened by sinister intentions, made all the more dangerous by her increasing disregard for the lives that passed through her doorstep. Though her husband was the one who did the smothering, the killing, it was she who devised the plots, chose the victims, and gave the nod to snuff out their lives. When Lavinia felt restless and unable to sleep, she would often slip from her chamber. Gas lamp in hand, she descended from the third story of the hotel all the way to the basement. And here, the air was cool, damp, impossibly quiet. Upon the packed earth were telltale traces of having been dug up recently, a nearby shovel, a bag of quicklime. The sense that something in the air was different, or not quite right. She liked to sit on the mound of bodies beneath her, their still faces in varying positions of decay. They were layered like sediments in the earth or rings in an oak tree. Everything from the dry bone of their first victim to the very recent wet stages of rot, just days before. And though she could not see them through the earth, they were etched into her memory. The murders were the root of her sleeplessness. It was the dreams, her midnight visitors. That nagging sense that she was never truly alone anymore. They whispered, wandered through the halls of her home, 
and she adored their attention. And sitting in that basement with her eyes blank and distant, thoughtfulness, a contented grin would settle upon her face. It wasn't about the money anymore. But in February of 1819, a chance encounter would herald the end of Lavinia's spree. The locals began to grow suspicious of the six-mile wayfarer house. Though rumors were spreading of missing travelers, the most pertinent piece of gossip surrounded the Fisher's less inconspicuous aid of the highwaymen that so terrorized the backwoods. In the winter of that year, the locals gathered up a group of vigilantes and raided the hotel. There was no investigation of the basement, no thorough uncovering of the true terrors taking place. John Fisher was beaten within an inch of his life, and Lavinia left to play the role of the dumbfounded wife who didn't know any better. The vigilantes left satisfied, believing their scare tactic would put an end to the Fisher's cooperation with criminals. But to be certain, they left one man behind to keep an eye on the establishment. David Ross. The evening after the raid, Ross was attacked by two men staying at the inn and dragged before a group of others. These were the bandits. While Mr. Fisher was still nursing his wounds somewhere in the hotel, it was Lavinia who confronted the now isolated vigilante. Surrounded by a group of cutthroats and criminals, she stood before him not as a wife nor a distressed damsel, but as a ringleader. It wasn't just the locals who heard rumors of missing travelers. The highwaymen, who knew the hotel better than most, saw the quicklime, the loose earth in the basement, and the mounting despair of Mr. Fisher, who, unlike his wife, struggled to live with their actions. Most of them put two and two together, and they knew precisely just what kind of person she had become. So Lavinia sent her own message. Before the group of men, she choked David to the point of unconsciousness, then smashed his head through a nearby window. She beat him until his eyes ran red with his own blood. A laceration from the broken glass poured scarlet, and in her relentless pounding against his skull, her garments became spattered with it. Knowing that the vigilantes would raise alarm if Ross went missing, she couldn't afford to add him to her collection, so he was let go. Free to run to the authorities with stories of a femme fatale and her lawless group of thieves and an insatiable bloodlust. Standing before them, watching David sprint off towards Charleston in the dead of night, there was no question that Lavinia, consciously or no, had somehow usurped the highest authority within that deadly band of men. A torch held aloft nearby cast her silhouette along the ground where pools of blood glistened. The darkness of her shadow was put to shame by the gleam in her eyes, the gaze of a demon staring out into the night. Even with the testimony of Ross, the authorities were surprisingly lenient. It appeared to them that the Fishers and the Vigilantes had developed some grudge against one another, but without proof of them abetting the highwaymen, they saw Ross's beating as a retaliation well within her rights. Lavinia got to work like she never had before. John could no longer stomach her insatiable appetite for murder. But there would be one final project that the couple worked on together, before they agreed that her plots would be left solely to her own hands. For nearly a week, John and Lavinia worked together in the chamber most commonly given to isolated travelers. It was located directly above the basement. With saws and hand tools, they bolted the bed to the floorboards and outfitted it with a trap door. At the flip of a mechanism on the adjacent wall, the entire floor would hinge open and throw the bed wide into an abyss. Directly beneath it were a patch of sharpened stakes secured to the ground. It was for this reason that stormy evenings quickly became Lavinia's favorite. It was the only time when she could use the trapdoor while others were sleeping in the hotel. On the opposite wall, while the victim fell into a deep stupor from the laced tea, she would wait for a particularly loud clap of thunder, then throw the lever down. 
There would be no scream, no sound save for the crunch of bones, the tearing of flesh, the first rush of blood followed by the steady patter. If anybody came to investigate, they would find Lavinia replacing the now empty bed, designed to return to position with ease through a system of pulleys and rope. Removing the impaled victims from the stakes became the most arduous task. John, her husband, watched from afar as her wife descended into a depthless passion. But even when it came to removing men twice her size, her hunger was boundless, and she quickly grew a taste for the work. That was until one evening. A traveler by the name of Arthur Wright stopped by the six-mile Wayfarer house. Lavinia's downfall would be that same uncanny intuition that countless survivors have felt in the presence of killers, in places whose otherwise clean walls are dripping with intangible amounts of suffering, painted with horror, undiscernible to the human eye. The air itself choked with the actoplasm of silent victims. Arthur sensed that he was being questioned by the fishers, not introduced. His purse was being weighed by their eyes. His pulse felt with Lavinia's longing stare. Luckily for you, we just had a room open up before you arrived, she said, satisfied to cap off their conversation. A fire was popping in the hearth. Lavinia stood up and clasped her hands together, her teeth gleaming in the low light. John cleared his throat, and rather shakily said, How about some tea, then? But Arthur was well-traveled. He'd been in the presence of nefarious people before, knew his way around a situation that would get the better of him, but not wanting to tip off his suspicion, he accepted the new room graciously, and went off to bed with a rather full cup of tea. Aside from his suspicions, Arthur didn't enjoy tea. <laughs> And so, when it came time to rest for the evening, instead of taking to the bed, he sat down at a chair near the door. Hours later, he was stirred by a terribly loud crash. The floor rattled. A decorative plate hanging on the wall fell, its shards skittering across the floor. Still dressed and in his boots, he jumped to his feet, forgetting that the full cup of tea still rested in his hands, and that, too, fell with another light crash. His eyes followed the trail of tea spilling onto the floor, where it dripped through a now gaping hole where his bed used to be. Then he heard the slow creaking of footsteps on the opposite side of the wall, floorboards bending subtly beneath a light weight, a key slipping into the keyhole of his chamber. Without a second thought, Arthur snatched up his satchel and escaped through the window of his room. Having scaled the side of the hotel, he hopped on his horse and galloped away. A single glance behind him would reveal the petite silhouette of Lavinia standing in the unlit room, and tremors rolled down his spine. The authorities in Charleston arrived the morning after, tipped off by Arthur and searched through the hotel, finding the trapdoor in the chamber, the sharpened stakes in the basement, and the earth below, overflowing with at least a hundred sets of remains. In September, fishers were arrested and placed in the old Charleston jail. An escape was nearly made, and then thwarted. Their execution was set for February. But Lavinia, Believing that she would inevitably be pardoned because she was a woman, was as confident in herself as ever. John, overcome with guilt, would go quietly on the morning of February 18th, 1820, to the gallows. Before him and his wife was a crowd of over 2,000 people. The minister accompanying John was asked to read a letter. In it, John asked for mercy for those who had judged him apparently incorrectly but he then contradicted himself, pleading his case in front of the crowd, and then once more when he asked for their forgiveness for the crimes committed. The hangman did an admirable job, and when John's trapdoor was swung, the drop broke his neck cleanly. But Lavinia 
was the antithesis of her husband. No trace of guilt nor shame, save for the regret of having been captured, was written on her expression. She refused to cooperate, and had to be carried forcefully to her noose. And when it was time for it to be placed around her neck, she said to the crowd, If you have a message for the devil, tell me now, for I shall be seeing him shortly. But no message was relayed to Lavinia. Her demeanor, her demonic sneer, incurred a petulant wrath from the crowd. She had already stolen countless possessions and lives through the six-mile wayfarer house. But even upon the scaffold before a crowd of thousands, she would steal something else. The very job of the executioner. Instead of waiting for her trapdoor or the bag that would obscure her face, Lavinia leapt from the platform, where she dangled and writhed just in front of the crowd, and onlookers reported that they had never seen such a wicked stare as on that 27-year-old woman's face. It was a stare accompanied by a frigid sneer, unwavering in her death throes, that hinted at a kind of raw evil rare even in this world. What was made unbridled in her hands, even then, reaching out with curling fingers for some last, final vengeance to exact in her final moments. Before we finish off this episode, I'd like to remind everybody that this show is done by one individual. If you'd like to keep Mania independent, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash Harlequin Grimm, and thank you very much for supporting the Grimm Theater. Now let's continue. I wonder how many of you were itching for this part of the episode. If I knew anything about the Six Mile Wayfarer house or Lavinia Fisher, I know that I would be. Curiously enough, I got the idea for this episode from somebody who left a comment on a TikTok video of mine, so thank you, whoever you are, and forgive me for not making a note of who it was. But it was this one comment that started my passion for this episode. Lavinia was introduced to me as America's first female serial killer, and I thought, oh perfect. Who doesn't love a femme fatale lead, especially one from history? But pretty early on into my digging, it became apparent that this term that has now latched itself onto Lavinia is dubious at best. There's actually very little evidence to suggest that she was a serial killer. It's true. Some remains were found in the hotel. But it isn't clear that they were linked to the Fishers. Their association with the highwaymen and willing compliance with their crimes, in all likelihood, is what got them the death sentence. But some historians have gone so far as to suggest that their execution was part of a conspiracy on part of an organization that wanted to seize their land. Now, I didn't dig far enough to confirm this, but one thing remained painfully clear. Lavinia was not America's first female serial killer, far from it. But the next episode of this show is going to unearth the woman who has rightfully earned that title. What makes Lavinia fascinating is that she embodies a very dangerous cultural mechanism. That is, our ability to take things on faith so long as a particular story or legend, in this case, is shared enough and with enough earnestness. I'm horrified to report that some tour guides in Charleston share stories very much like Mania's rendition, as though it is entirely factual. Bed frames with trapdoors beneath them, hundreds of bodies piled beneath basement floors, and stakes sharpened to a fine point to catch the unsuspecting, drugged bodies. All this peddled alongside ghost sightings of her and claims that her apparition is still at large, causing mischief. Even still, our intuitions can point us in the right direction. The laced tea, the interrogation of guests, the robberies, the abetting of highwaymen, all of this is believable, and quite likely the truth behind what has now become pure legend. From a storyteller's perspective, Lavinia's actions are made believable through her rapid, if not steady, descent from a murder hobbyist into a fully-fledged enthusiast and expert, and it is a romantic story by its own right, one that I felt deserved a grand retelling, indulging in all of those penny dreadful fixings. Many devices of the tale remain rooted in verified accounts, such as the vigilante group that ransacked the hotel, and the man planted there who was beaten, though not by Lavinia. Arthur, 
who was renamed from John to avoid confusion with the murderess's husband, remains a more doubtful element. But by far and away, the most treasured detail from this story is Lavinia's final sacrilegious declaration before her life was taken from her. Though she may not have jumped from the scaffold, the quotation of her appealing for any messages needing distribution to the devil is apparently true, and how delightful. And that, if nothing else, solidifies Lavinia as a true legend in my heart. So thank you once again for joining Mania. Revisit the Grimm Theater in a few weeks' time to hear stories of America's verified first female serial killer, Jane Toppin. Until then, as always, the theater is ever open to you.